This episode was sponsored by our patrons, Julie Gray, Mary Jones, Jessica Smith, Kim Hokinson, Jan Elise Cannon, Jamie Lang, Jill Harrigan, Maria Sanchez, Heather McKinnon, Valerie Jacobson, Chantel Oliver, Katrina and Kristen, Tam Zane Weir, Caitlin McTaggart, and Tori Cornish. Thank you so much for being our sponsors. We couldn't do it without you. Hi, Olivia. Hi, Katie. In January 1893, a group of American and European businessmen overthrew Queen Lili Uokulani of Hawaii. Ah, uh, yes. Claiming that they had U.S. military backing, which they did not. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Surprising how easy an overthrow can be sometimes. Yep. They just declared themselves the provisional government of the new Republic of Hawaii. I mean, it had worked for a few hundred years, so... <laughs> I guess. The queen uh, sat down, wrote to her friend, President Grover Cleveland of the United States of America. And uh, when he got the letter, he said, uh, no, he declared their behavior an act of war, but didn't do anything about it. <gasps> I'm shocked. <laughs> shocked. <laughs> the businessmen got to work eradicating Hawaiian culture ASAP because mm -hmm. like this is prime real estate after all it is the most remote island chain in the world smack in the middle of the Pacific Ocean that is prime yep by 1895 there was an uprising to reinstate the monarchy and reclaim the kingdom of Hawaii Ooh. And like many such noble uprisings where native peoples went up against colonizers who had Gatling guns, mm -hmm. it failed. Yep. So the queen, the rebel leaders, and her supporters were arrested. Her followers were sentenced to death, and she was offered a deal. They said, give up the crown, and we will commute the death sentences of all your followers. Mm. So she did, and was imprisoned in a room in her own palace. <sighs> the future of Hawaii was so uncertain. And that April, 1895, a baby girl was born on the Big Island. Mm. Her mother's tribe claimed an ancient connection to Pele, goddess of the volcano. Yeah. She was delivered by her grandmother, who was a midwife, a healer, a wise elder. Mm -hmm. And when her grandmother saw her, she knew. She said, this one is special. She will be our Puna Hele, the carrier of our traditions. Those men, they might try to erase us, but we will save it all inside her. Wow. Mary Kavena Pukui would indeed go on to fulfill her destiny. She saved Hawaiian language and culture from catastrophic loss. Hmm. Wow. So, let's go to Hawaii today, shall we? Okay. I'm Katie Nelson. I'm Olivia Mickle. And this is What's Her Name? Fascinating women you've never heard of. In a Kailua garden a couple months ago, <gasps> I had a lovely visit with Dr. Eve Kohler. Eve Okura Kohler. Okay. I'm from Hilo, Hawaii. And Mary Kavena Pukui was also from my island, oh. from Hawaii Island. My Her doctorate doctor is in linguistics, linguistics but she also has degrees in anthropology and has worked as an archaeologist. And in all her years of research, Mary Kavena Pukui's name kept coming up everywhere because she wrote pretty much everything that Dr. Kohler was reading. Wow. Actually, wow. Only in talking with you now am I realizing why I was interested in her to begin with. Ah. I, on an I used to be an archaeologist, and on an excavation, my assignment was to research Hawaiian place names uh, of the area we were in. It was conservational archaeology, so we weren't digging up any ancestral bones. We were surveying a lo'i system, which is a Hawaiian tarot patch system. So uh, I had to research Hawaiian place names and she also wrote the book of Hawaiian place names with a list of all the traditional place names in Hawaii, in Hawaiian, 
and what they mean in English and their and why they're named that. Wow. So I realized how much of my research has been because of, through her writings. Yeah. Because I didn't know anything about her except that she, it was her name on all these sources I was using. Cool. So it was fun to learn more about Yeah. Her. As a graduate student, I worked at the Smithsonian. I got to co-author a paper on women in the history of Native American linguistics hmm. um, and presented on that in London. And so this is kind of fun because I used her dictionary and her book of Proverbs for my research at the Smithsonian. I, I was thinking about this. One of the reasons I was drawn to her is uh, she was biracial and I'm biracial. Her mother was Mary Pa'ahana Kanaka'ole, a native Hawaiian woman, and her father was Henry Nathaniel Wiggin, a Caucasian man. And although I don't have that significant position in history that she had, when you're biracial, you're exposed to different worlds, different ways of thinking, different ways of being that can kind of clash sometimes, but she found a way to harmonize them and to poetically translate them into each other, literally and figuratively. And her, on her mother's side, she was descended from a line of chiefs, chiefs of Pele, who is the volcano goddess in Hawaii. Hmm. And uh, on her father's side, she was descended from Simon Bradstreet and Anne Bradstreet. Simon Bradstreet oh. was uh, governor of the Massachusetts Bay Colony. Yeah. And Anne Bradstreet was a poet. And so she came from uh, powerful lines on both sides of her family. Puritans. and Bradstreet was Whoa. his ancestor. <laughs> yeah. And he wow. had moved to Hawaii. What a family history on yeah. both sides. <laughs> <laughs> wow. She was born April 20th, 1895. 1895. In her grandmother's house, Nali'i Po'ai Moku. She was called Po'ai for short. That was her grandmother. Mm. And her grandmother was what you call a kahuna la'au lapa'au, which is uh, she was an expert at traditional medicine and using plants for healing. Mm. Her grandmother was also a hula dancer for the royal court and traveled with Queen Emma when she was younger. Her grandmother was also a traditional midwife and would um, wow. deliver children. So was her grandmother kind of saying, like, this one is special? Yes, exactly. Mm. Yes. So in Hawaiian culture, there's a thing called a puna hele. And puna means a spring of water or a source or origin. And hele means to go or to move forward. Mm. So puna hele is like the source moving forward. Sometimes a grandchild or a child would be picked as a punahele, which means they are the one that the elders want to carry forward the traditions. So she was selected. I know I got chicken skin. We say chicken skin in Hawaii instead of goosebumps. But I got chicken skin when I said that. I didn't know you did too. Um, So she was selected to be the punahele and the favored grandchild. And the other kids knew she was the favored grandchild, but they weren't bitter about it. It was just accepted. Oh, also her full name. Now, because Dr. Kohler wrote about place names, she had a good opportunity to study the meaning, the deep meaning of names in Hawaii. In Hawaii, your name is usually really long, but it tells you something about like your your life's mission or your purpose. Mary, Abigail, Kavena ula o kalani a hii aka ika poli o pele kavahine ai honua pukui is her last name. What does it mean? It, <laughs> according to this source, it means the rosy glow in the sky made by hii aka, who was raised in the bosom of Pele, the earth consuming woman. So Pele is the fire goddess or the volcano goddess. Her mother's line, the native Hawaiian side, came from a line of chiefs of Pele, who was the volcano goddess. And then hii aka was. Pele's favorite daughter. So, Mary Kavena Pukui uh, was raised by her grandmother, but her upbringing was special, was not 
typical of all children. Mm -hmm. So she was, it's called Hanai in Hawaiian culture, mm -hmm. where you kind of adopt uh, and raise someone as your own child. Oh. Her grandmother Hanai'd her and raised her in the traditional Hawaiian way. And because she was special, so she had a, a very unique childhood. This was not normal for all children. Mm -hmm. uh, she spent more time with her grandmother than with other children. Mm -hmm. She learned the old Hawaiian ways. She learned the language, she learned the culture. And other children were not allowed to touch her head. It, it was a kapu or a taboo. And other children were also not allowed to hit her, either seriously or playfully, because she was special. So. Her grandmother taught her to speak fluent native Hawaiian. And her, her grandmother, grandmother would, would take her on these week-long trips where they'd go and live on the shore and they'd build this, you know, temporary structures and just live off the land. She was very intentionally taking her out of society and teaching her all the old ways. Teach her la'au, lapa'au, the traditional medicine with the plants. Mm. Teach her all of the cultural knowledge. It probably included going to sacred sites as well and hearing all the legends, the stories. When she was nine years old... When she was nine, her education was complete or would have to suffice because her grandmother... Her grandmother passed away. Aww. It must have been a huge moment in her life. Yeah. And she went back to live with her parents. She wanted to continue to live in the traditional Hawaiian way, and her parents supported that. Her father also wanted her to take advantage of having a father who was a native English speaker oh. and he wanted her to learn literacy in English. Mm. He also introduced her to poetry from her own ancestor Anne Bradstreet. So huh. the Hawaiian chants and songs through her grandmother and then English poetry through her father. I mean Anne Bradstreet she's the first female poet yeah. published in England or America. That's amazing. Wow. That's a, a massive matriarchal legacy to be yeah. handing to a nine-year-old yes. you know. <laughs> She went to an English boarding school. Mm -hmm. And here's the crazy thing. Before this overthrow of the Kingdom of Hawaii, Hawaii was the most literate nation in the world. Yep. Which I had no idea. When it was the Hawaiian Kingdom, it was the most literate country in the world. It had oh. the highest literacy rate. And uh, there were, a, I mean, some people say 15, 20 different Hawaiian newspapers. And so she would read the newspapers in Hawaiian. Um, but then after the annexation of Hawaii to the United States, it's being intentionally eradicated. Mm -hmm. Like this many newspapers and that many readers, that is not good mm -hmm. for the man being able to control the masses. We can't have this. Yep. She went to the Central Grammar School and the Bethel Grammar School and Kavaya Ha'o Seminary, which was a boarding school. She was a boarding student for a while. And there is one account of her being in school, and there was a new student who didn't know what was going on and asked Mary Kavena Pukui a question in Hawaiian. So Mary Kavena Pukui answered her in Hawaiian to try to explain what was happening. And the teacher heard her and scolded her and punished her for a week for speaking her own language mm. in school. So that was a very sad a very tragic memory that she had for her entire life of the difficulty of preserving the Hawaiian language and culture and being punished mm -hmm. for using her own language. Mm -hmm. She survived it. She took what she could from it, and at age 15, she could see what was happening. She was the Puna Hele, and it was time to fulfill her destiny. She 
started when she was 15 years old. She started writing down the legends and the chants and translating them on her own. No one asked her to do it, but she felt called to it in a sense. And because she had this perfect fluency in both native Hawaiian and English hmm. and literacy in both, she was the perfect translator. Mm. And she was able to take Hawaiian chants and songs that were very poetic, the Hawaiian language is very poetic and metaphoric, and translate it into English, in, in very poetic English. Mm. I think she was trying to more accurately represent Hawaiian language and culture for what they were, rather than inaccurate stereotypes that existed. Mm -hmm. And I think she was literally trying to translate cultural mindset to Westerners so they could try to try to help them to understand better because she was a, one of the few people who was able to do that because she could see both and I, I like to say she was immersed in both worlds not part way in each world she in wasn't between them she was completely immersed in both and because of that she was fluent in both and understood Hawaiian culture in a way and understood Western culture in a way that she could explain Hawaiian culture in Western culture. Starting in the 1930s, she makes these field recording trips in earnest. Hmm. And she's armed with this big old tape recorder. <laughs> tape recorder in the 1930s. Yeah. <laughs> and a binder that she would write her notes in. She, wow. But she would never write while the person was talking. She was always just listening fully present. Hmm. And then only after she had left would she pull out her pen and her binder and make notes. Wow. She had three daughters and she brought them with her and she trained them in all her techniques. Hmm. When she was 18, she married Napoleon Kaloli'i. They had three daughters. Two were adopted or Hanai hmm. and one was biological. So... Her, one of her adopted daughters was named Patience and was Japanese. And one was named Faith and she was half Hawaiian, half Japanese. Mm. Then her biological daughter, she named Pele, mm. the volcano goddess. Mm. So well, there was something else. Oh, she went back to school when she was 23. She went to the Hawaiian Mission Academy and received her high school diploma uh, at 28 years old. Cool. So she writes about place names. Um, I did a paper on place names once when I was an undergraduate, and it was primarily using her book of the ancient Hawaiian temple names. She knows a lot of the place names of the area, and they reflect the stories of the place and the mythology and the legends, the sacred history and the cultural history of the place. Mm. And while she's collecting literally thousands of hours of audio artifacts from across Hawaii, it becomes clear that the remaining native speakers will not last long. Yeah. So what's really needed is a dictionary. Ha <laughs> ha. Yay. She can project into the future that there needs to be some kind of written record of the language for all future generations because mm. even though all the native speakers right now you know understand it fully she can see when it dies out so much is going to be lost yeah and so she begins work on her magnum opus well there wasn't writing per se that we know of be before the romanized alphabet mm. There were petroglyphs, but the uh, Roman alphabet was adopted to depict the Hawaiian mm. language. I mean, that's astounding amounts of work. That's, you know. Yeah. You're deciding how to transliterate all of this and how to how these pronunciations get written. and Yes, exactly. But there are, are sounds in Hawaiian that are really important distinctions that there aren't letters for. Mm. 
in the Roman alphabet. Like there's the glottal stop, you right. know, like Hawaii. Mm-hmm. And and then there's long vowels versus short vowels. They, mm. they completely change the meaning of a word. Right. And so uh, in her dictionary, she used diacritical marks. The kahako and okina are diacritical marks. The kahako is a line that goes over vowels to show that the vowel is a long vowel. Okay. Hawaiian has long vowels and short vowels, and they are they have phonemic contrast, which means they change the meaning of the word. Mm-hmm. And then the okina is it looks like a reverse apostrophe. Yeah. And uh, that is the glottal stop, and that also has phonemic contrast in Hawaiian, so it's considered a letter in the alphabet. Ah. So without it, it changes the meaning. The Hawaiian language always had it in, in its spoken language, but it wasn't in the writing. Mm. So you wouldn't know, unless they wrote two of the vowels, you wouldn't know if those two vowels are supposed to be a long vowel, mm. like two a, uh, ah, uh, or is it supposed to be a, uh, ah. Uh. Mm-hmm. And so wow. anyways, I, as a linguist nerd, yeah. I love that. <laughs> And while she was working on this, I mean, this took, this is like years and years <laughs> in the making. Can you imagine literally making a dictionary of all words? <laughs> while she was working on it, she was getting pushback from two very different sides. So on the one hand, there's politicians who are questioning whether it was worth the investment by the Bishop Museum to support such a project because they were like, why spend all of these resources all this time recording a dead language? They ah. said, like, this is such a waste. So they want, didn't want to fund the project. They wanted to stop it. But at the same time, other Hawaiians didn't like that she was sharing so yeah. much. So some people even criticized her in her lifetime for sharing so much. Uh, of the culture but she wanted people to understand and she said she was doing it for her grandchildren so that they would have it and for other people's grandchildren. One of the amazing things that we have is because she was constantly recording other people we have sometimes recordings of her Mm. and one time she even just very succinctly stated what she's doing and why she's doing it. We're in Hawaii, remain Hawaii Without the knowledge of Hawaiian culture, without it, what will make Hawaii distinctive? If we make no effort to preserve, all we can, but then. I am now exchanging knowledge with those interested in Hawaiians themselves, their thinking pattern, the why of some of their behavior. I tell them of the old. And they tell me of the new, and together we learn. I like to learn, even if I am over three score and ten. Because I know my mother's language, I've enjoyed exchanging thoughts with other Polynesians to discover our likenesses and our differences. And because I know my father, I can explain to others what we have had here and lost and what we still retain. Knowledge, to me, is life. Knowledge, to me, is life. (laughs) Is what she was always known to say. We need that on a (laughs) t-shirt. For her, knowledge is to be shared in order for it to grow and not die out, not kept secret. Shared. And while she was working... Her work became more renowned, and she was more and more in the public eye. Everyone realized that she was this, like, walking archive and a public treasure. And in fact, in In 1977, she was named a living treasure of Hawaii. (laughs) They named her a public treasure. Her daughter recalled that their house was, she said it was, quote, like Grand Central Station, with visitors constantly coming and going. She welcomed everyone who wanted to come and learn, but she also wanted welcomed people who wanted to come and share their knowledge and record what they knew. Wow. She's just like this community center for Hawaiian culture. She's and a, yeah, she's a whole oral history archive herself. In one person. Yeah. Wow. But that really slowed progress on her great work of the dictionary. Mm -hmm. She had an assistant, 
um, and he worked on the technical side of it. Samuel Albert, mm -hmm. but he is recorded as saying that it was really her dictionary. He was her student, oh. and so officially they co-authored it, but um, according to him it was really her. He appears in a documentary recalling their work together, and it's so sweet. He actually breaks down crying as he Aww. tries to speak of how much respect he had for her. Aww. And in 1957, the dictionary was published. Yay! And it's still the authoritative source everywhere. Hmm. Eve Kohler has a copy of it. I mean, there's even an online Hawaiian dictionary which is based entirely on her dictionary. She is wow, the I've source. Wow, I've used that. That's from her? That's her. Wow. Yeah, any Anytime you've looked up a Hawaiian word, wow. you can thank her. She is the punahele, the source moving forward. Wow. That's cool. Uh, Mary Kavena Pukui, in her lifetime, ended up having over 50 scholarly publications just about Hawaiian, about Hawaiian language, language and, and culture. culture. Yeah. So she is considered the preeminent Hawaiian scholar of the 20th century. Wow. No one published as much as she did. No one knew as much as she did. Because she was raised by her grandmother, it was unusual for her to have that, that depth of knowledge of mm. Hawaiian. Not just what it says literally, but what it meant culturally. And so uh, scholars would go to her as, when she was older and ask her for help and would um, ask her to be their consultant to understand the Hawaiian mind and Hawaiian mm. culture. They developed social work books for Hawaiian culture based on some of the things that she wrote because she went so in-depth explaining. She was in between both worlds. She was immersed in both worlds, not in between. Yeah. She was completely fluent in both worlds, not just linguistically, but culturally. Mm. So she could explain to Westerners, the Hawaiian mindset and Hawaiian psychology and Hawaiian culture wow. and why people did what they did. And in 1995, she was added to the Hawaiian Music Hall of Fame. So she wrote the lyrics for and composed over 150 Hawaiian songs. What? Wow. I, I love that. What? It's like, oh, also, meanwhile, she oh, wrote 150 songs. Wow. <laughs> because she was channeling that poetic matriarchal heritage yeah. that she had, I think. She has that wow. poetic understanding of life and words and dance and story. Yeah. She collected proverbs, she collected folk tales, and as she was getting older, her mm -hmm. daughters worked tirelessly to collect all the proverbs and all of her translations of the proverbs and get it edited and published before she passed. And they mm -hmm. finished just before she passed. Um, but the thing is with translating proverbs, like, you can translate the literal words but it's not going to yeah, tell not, you much no. unless you have the cultural context. Like, can you think of an English example of a proverb where like... Yeah, I actually I actually had to help someone with this once. My When I was in China, my Mandarin tutor had been hired to translate all of the sort of signage for a major art exhibit. But there were a few that she brought to me because she was just kind of baffled by them. For example, you can't make an omelet without breaking eggs. Oh. And she uh -huh. was like, what? Why is this? Uh -huh. And then she had to figure out a way to explain that in Mandarin. It, yes. Without writing a full paragraph. Like, what is a similar-ish concept idiom that we have right. that might work? And right. it was, she spent a long time with me. Is it saying it's good to break eggs slash people to make the oh. omelet? Or is it, what's the more yeah, what connotation yeah. oh, of it cool. and are you supposed to or is it a commentary and we, we had this whole long conversation about it yeah and and those especially from from all the hawaiian proverbs she collected that i've yeah. read they are especially metaphorical and just mm -hmm. like almost all of them out of context it it means nothing yeah. to me i don't understand it at all they're always in metaphor mm -hmm. but i remember one um, 
which maybe isn't fair to parents, but it, its literal translation is the goodness of the tree is judged by the groove. But it means that the goodness of the parent is judged by the child. Oof. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> as I said, it's not fair to parents. <laughs> but that one stuck with me as a kid because I felt like, oh boy, oh, I better yeah. be a good kid. But if you were to just have the literal translation written down, even that would have been lost. Right? Yeah. The, the actual proverb. But if you just had the literal translation, the goodness of the tree is judged by the groove. It, it misses out on the entire yeah. cultural meaning. And yeah. so every proverb is like that. And she collected and, and then translated and explained the proverbs. Wow. Cool, because you like need the cultural context right. to understand what why groove in a tree and why like. they would say it in a certain yeah. context. And she also collected folk tales. She taught hula, and she recorded literally thousands of hours of Hawaiians speaking, remembering, sharing their knowledge. Wow! For me, the best part is that by the time she lived a long, full life, and by the time she was done. She could see her impact. She lived to see hmm. the great Hawaiian cultural renaissance of the 1970s. She yeah. was elderly, but she lived to see it. And she was the one who did it. Yeah, it only happened because she did that. Yeah. Wow. She knew what she was doing. Mm. I don't know if she realized how huge of an impact it would have. Mm. Well, I guess in the 70s and the 80s, the cultural renaissance was already happening so she lived through all of it how cool she got to see it work yeah right cool. wow that gave me chicken skin again oh. the hawaiian language revitalization movement and the hawaiian cultural renaissance could not have happened without mary kavena pukui because without her, they wouldn't, there wouldn't be so much knowledge of Hawaiian language and culture. It would have been lost. I think we all want to leave a legacy for those who come after you in some way. And some people do it through their children, and some people do it through their work, and some people do it in both ways. Or, um, And she wanted to leave something for her grandchildren. But it was unique and something we can't relate to in that she was almost single-handedly carrying her, the entire culture on her back mm -hmm. and passing it forward by recording it. And so... I don't know that any of us will ever be in that position, right? Where your entire language and culture is coming through you. You are the vehicle for it. If she hadn't recorded all the chants and songs and legends and translated them and explained what each word meant and created that dictionary we wouldn't have that vast body of knowledge and her grandchildren wouldn't have it so she may have single-handedly uh, more than perhaps any other individual saved the hawaiian language and culture from being lost wow <laughs> we we can't relate to her life. Yeah. We, none of us, I think, will know that burden. That an entire culture, yeah. you are carrying it. I'm glad I can't relate to that because yeah. <laughs> I don't think I would succeed. It was such a mammoth task. Yeah. A task that could only be completed with an entire lifetime of tireless work. Wow. And she did it. I, I don't think I could have done it. Hmm. But you know what we all could do? We could bust out our phones. We could record the elders even for just 20 minutes. Yeah. We could document the neighborhood. <laughs> we could record the songs. We could note down the jokes the kids are saying these days. <laughs> we can record the recipes. Yeah. The memes, the poems, the metaphors. All these things, they're so ephemeral. 
And they don't get recorded unless someone thinks to do it. Mm. And I guess in a way we're all going to be in that position. We're going to be the older ones. Maybe wanting younger kids to know what it was like before. Mm. Before the world changed so much. Special thanks to Dr. Eve Kohler for bringing us the story of Mary Kavena Pukui, and to Michelle Henderson for the introduction. If you want to learn more about Mary Kavena Pukui, we have links on our website, including her Hawaiian dictionary, her book of Proverbs, and a couple of short documentaries on YouTube, plus a large collection of historical Hawaiian music at the Library of Congress for which I would like to extend special thanks to Judith Gray at the American Folklife Center for her brilliant assistance in finding all these historical recordings for this episode, all dating to pre-1920, plus ukulele tunes from Chris Hagen and Doug Maxwell. Our interns are Kira Maxwell and Katie Boucher. Thank you so much for donating, and thanks for listening. 